Oh I actually have a lecture today. So, oh, yeah, you don't need to. So, okay, and in fact, um, yep, um, and I'm recording them. Yeah. yeah. So, um, start off with a little discussion. It's going to be, hopefully, it's not patronizing, but uh, uh, I want to sort of start at a high level. So, why do we do experiments? Mm -hmm. To answer a question. Oh, okay. So, can you elaborate a little more about that? <laughs> don't, no, don't. Questions about what? Um, questions about things we don't know. <laughs> 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 Stick into the <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that's, no, that's good. Um, any other input? Okay. Verify prior findings. So there might be some existing literature that we want to replicate. Can't do requirements of the graduate program. There we go. <laughs> 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 Someone had to say it. We're all thinking that. Um. Let's see what? Because it's fun. <laughs> well, okay. There we go. Science because it's fun. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, is, so what do we typically do in an experiment? What are the general features of most experiments? You take measurements. You take measurements? Independent, independent variables. Okay, yeah, you have some sort of, those might be among the measured things. You're, you explicitly manip them, manipulate them to be at certain sort of points on the measurement scale. And then you measure something else and you predict one from the other. Sometimes there's research where you're not manipulating the variable, you're just observing, so sex and height sort of thing. Create groups and compare across groups. Okay, yeah. Develop hypotheses. Okay, so we develop hypotheses, so questions about... <laughs> uh, but <laughs> usually connecting to some sort of overarching theory of how the world works that you might have some point of uncertainty about and you want to get new data to sort of help you decide amongst those uncertainties help reduce that uncertainty maybe all right next one uh and these are just to sort of prime your mind what's a p-value Arbitrary cutoff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, no, like. It's probability that if you ran it a hundred times, you would get the weight. Uh. Basically, tells you how likely your results were chance. So, if you're using PO5, if you ran the experiment a hundred times, it means that 95 of those times. It's Your results are going to be different from each other. Yeah, yeah. something like that. <laughs> probability that you accept the null hypothesis. It is the probability that you accept the null hypothesis. Any other? Probability of the null hypothesis. No, so null the probability of your. Um, sorry, I'm mixing up with the Bayesian processes. What did I say? Mm -hmm. so the probability of uh, your data, given that the null hypothesis. Okay. Probability of committing a type That's one error. <laughs> I don't remember which. Okay, so type. we're starting to get ideas of mm -hmm. errors. So it's kind of in the presumably errors imply that we're making some sort of decision that could be right or could be wrong. Um, all right. Again, just kind of trying to prime seed your minds. So we're gonna have a quick quiz. Um, this is a little bit of a medical example, but it helps illustrate things. So, in a clinical trial of a particular test for cancer, the test was 80% accurate at identifying individuals with cancer, and 70% accurate in giving those without cancer a clean bill of health. So, you have some sort of gold standard that, ident that has already identified people with cancer and people without cancer. This new thing 
comes up and it's compared to the gold standard 80% accurate at identifying the ones that you know have cancer as having cancer and 70% accurate as identifying those you know don't have cancer as not having cancer. Given that information, a patient comes to you with a positive test. Is positive test saying they have cancer? Yes, cancer? yeah, cancer says, the positive test says you have cancer. Okay. What is the probability that they actually have cancer? The test isn't 100% accurate on both of those, so there's some uncertainty. So how uncertain are you that they have cancer? So just gut instinct, who thinks it's greater than 50%? Okay. Who thinks it's um, greater than 80%? No hands? Hmm? Who thinks it can't be answered yet? Okay. okay. <laughs> so yeah, so far you don't have enough information. Why? So what did you mean by base rate? Okay, so if I had that extra piece of information. <laughs> so, the base rate of cancer is 10%. So, without even seeing anybody, if you were to randomly grab a person in the population, you'd do well to guess they had a 10% or, well, 10% of the people that you grabbed would have cancer. So somebody comes to you with a positive test and you're asked what is the likelihood that they have cancer? Who would say it's greater than 50%? I don't know anyone. Just, what does your gut say? I think so, yes. Okay, greater than 80%? No. Greater than 60%? <laughs> Okay, you've got greater than 50, but how about the people below 50? Uh, how would you think it's greater than 10%? Is it precisely equal to 10%? Okay, so if, if the test were just a coin flip, you'd get, uh, you'd just stick with your base rate. So certainly it has to be equal to 10% or greater. Wouldn't it be 80% of the 10%? I would think no. that would be 80%. Because they could be a false positive. Uh, well, we'll get into the math in a second. I'm just trying to get your intuition so far. More, yeah. more. No. Okay, so it's definitely got, if the tests were just flipping a coin, it's got to be 10 or more. So who thinks it's greater than 40%? Greater than 30%? Greater than 20%? Around 30 to 20-30%. Okay. Uh, all right. I think there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, so that's a question that um, is really standard, like in your clinical practice for physicians, at least. I'm not sure, like, with the you guys don't really have like t t yeah. diagnostic tests, like well, oh, maybe yeah, for we uh, do, but not like this is 80 percent of the time. Like, you an so much more subjective. Yeah. yeah. It's in clinical judgment. You, I guess no you guys. One test that you would rely on yeah, you don't have a gold that. standard, and yes. then you're preparing. So, well, yeah. let's maybe uh, Alzheimer's. Don't have an exact I guess. Yeah. And mm. Alzheimer's. That's not even like in the DSM. It's not a. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's it not is. Is, is, it? The best is it? Okay. Because there is a, there is a gold standard diagnostic post mortem. Oh, well, mortem, yes. yeah. Yeah. well, there is a gold standard, and so any diagnostic tool used in that might could be in this class of things. I don't know. Um, in any event, this is not necessarily to connect to your clinical experience, more to get you set up to thinking about these issues. But um, this is a scenario that um, is classic, actually, in the judgment and decision-making literature as sort of evidencing that most people, including clinicians that are experiencing this decision in their daily lives are terrible at reasoning about. Um, the best way to present this problem to people is by turning those numbers, those percentages, um, into actual concrete counts. So if we've got a base rate of 10%, false negative of 20%, that's the same thing as that 80% I just 
turned it around. Um, and a false positive of 30%, um, that's the same thing as that 70%, I've just turned it around. You can think of 100 individuals being tested, 10 of which have cancer and 90 of which don't. That instantiates the base rate. So that's a 10% cancer rate in that 100%, 100 individuals. So given those 100 individuals, if you want to talk about that uh, false negative rate, or sorry, false, oh, I have those letters mixed up there. So it's 20%, oh no, yeah, 20% false negative rate. It means that of those 10 people with cancer, eight of the 10 people with cancer will have positive results that are accurate, but two will have that false negative. So they are supposed to have a positive result, but they falsely get a negative result. Similarly, the 30% false positive means that of the 90 people that have cancer, 30% of those people will have a falsely positive result. So 27 will have a falsely positive result. 63 will have a correct negative result. Uh, negative means whether the test says you have cancer or not. So positive, so the people... Um, yeah. So the people that do have cancer are the 10 people. And so that 20% dot is talking about the 10 people. Of those 10 people, 20% will have a negative result falsely. Oh, so we're saying 20% of individuals in Japan with cancer, they will have positive, not that they'll have positive on the test, they'll get a negative on the test. Yes, yeah. It's false. Eight will have a two. correct positive, and two will have a false negative. All 10 have to be false. Right, 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 yeah. right. Okay. Okay. So, okay, so... Having like worked out these numbers, we can actually see, okay, what are the people that have a positive result? Because that's the thing that's in front of us, somebody with a positive result, and all I need to do is look at the people with a positive result. So there's eight that have cancer and get a positive result, a true correct positive result, and there's 27 that don't have cancer but also have a positive result. So you can just... About, so, so 8 divided by 8 plus 27 is about 23%. So we started with a base, so if we didn't see anybody, we'd start out with like a belief of 10%. But now that we've seen their test, we will say, oh, okay, now I believe it. It's, uh, now I think that you have a 23% chance. So physicians, when they see these numbers, they sort of, they move too far from the base rate. Uh, usually they're like, oh, if I saw those numbers like 80% eh, accurate and 70% accurate for the two types, they would typically be like, oh, okay, so I figure like about 60%. Um, they're usually well above 50% as the likelihood that the person has the cancer rate. But um, if you actually work through the math, it's you're, you're supposed to stay closer to that base rate. So what I want to convey here not only this interesting scenario of sort of psychological um, irrationality on most humans' parts, but also in the critical scenario of clinicians, um, and also how to work it out properly, uh, is this idea that you had this prior information before you even saw the... So your patient comes in, before they open the envelope and show you that they have a positive result, you, you could make a guess at what is the probability they had cancer, and that's going to be 10%. You, the guess you use is the guess um, you'd apply to the, is the basic rate of it in the population. Um, but once you get new data in, you can update your beliefs or your guesses. Um, you still have to take into account, though, that original sort of guess, what that base rate was in the first place. So let that simmer for a little bit. And we'll move to talking about stuff that you guys are quite familiar with now, having done probably a bunch of stats in your undergrad and stats last year, which is the traditional approach that I'll be sort of using as a contrast to the Bayesian approach that we'll be taking. So let's say we have this sort of data. We've got height on the x-axis, counts on the y-axis, so these are histograms. We've got two colors here, men in pink and blue and women. 
um, which actually historically used to be one of the mappings. It's I don't do you know what the timeline is for when that was? Around the Victorian era, probably later. In any event, anyway. uh, this actually happened to be just the default code color coding that ggplot created. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it was particularly prevalent for clothing for babies. Um, like, I don't think adults, men would. Mm -hmm. So, um, if we had data like this, what sort of what can we sort of what information can we get out of this visual? <clears throat> Okay, so why do you say that? Okay, so you sort of notice a general shift of one coloring versus another coloring. Okay, yeah, so even though there's a shift difference, there's still overlap between them. It's not like they're completely separated. There's more variability. Okay, you might sort of, well, notice that there is variability in the, yeah, it's. Here, I'm gonna separate the two tables to at least. Well, I think it's just because the, it's balancing. Ah, so it just needs something underneath it. On both sides, yes. So it doesn't move back and forth. Let's see. Anybody have like, two right things thing. we could put under that are relatively equal height? I could take off keys, but I think I'd have to take off a lot of keys. Same wallet. I have some paperwork I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> No, this that's a little good. All right, so now it's not going to wiggle every time anybody moves. Okay, um, so notice that there seemed to be maybe a little bit more variability in one group than the other. Um, the, I mean, that actually implies that there's variability at all. So there's not just two bars, but there's some variability. Um, anything about the shape of that variability? That... OK, so you have this idea of a normal distribution where it sort of has a peak, and then it tapers off that sort of then some sort of rate on either side. OK, so traditional methods might look at this data and sort of generate a question. Um, if I measure the entire population for each sex, would I find that they're different? So you'd actually have to talk about like different how. You'd find some descriptive characteristic for the data. And uh, one commonly used descriptive characteristic is the arithmetic mean. Um, it turns out that like our eyeballs do that kind of automatically. Um, if you actually like took wooden blocks of those sizes and uh, just eyeballed where you'd want to put your finger to balance it perfectly, that actually ends up being the arithmetic mean. So um, we uh, both have a visual system that's able, and sort of cognitive system that is able to eyeball that fairly well. Um, and there's math to generate the arithmetic mean. We're not going to bother with that. It's just a, just think of it as sort of a shift parameter of some distribution. Um, so if we have the idea that we're going to use the arithmetic mean, we can reformulate the question. If I measure the entire population for each sex, would I find that they have different means? So you do everybody at once, uh, and you just compare the means. Is it different from zero? Um, equivalent, an equivalent way of phrasing that, if I, entire the measure, entire, hmm, if I measured the entire population for each sex, would I find that the difference between their means is precisely zero? That's a way of phrasing it so that you can talk about sort of a null hypothesis of zero um, difference between the means. So this is somewhat hard to answer without going into um, sort of, well, going out and measuring the entire population or using some tools that really weren't available to early statisticians. Um, so they decided they, instead of answering this question that is sort of the most obvious thing that you might want to ask, they decided to um, find, a, find a question that they could ask that they then could also answer. So what is that question that's 
asked by traditional methods. This. In a hypothetical world, with no difference between the sexes' heights, if I repeated the experiment many times, what proportion of the time would I obtain a difference between the observed means that is as great or greater than the difference I observed in my real experiment? So this is a rather different question. Um, this is easier to answer than the original question of um, the uh, if I were to go out and measure everything. Um, so let's break it down. So first of all, first thing to notice is that the question pertains to a hypothetical world, an imaginary world. So we're going to have to eventually decide how to get from a result that pertains to an imaginary world back to an inference about the real world. So that's going to be critical. So we're talking about something happening in an imaginary world that gets repeated many times. Um, so we're going to talk about the rate of something. That's why eventually we'll talk about a proportion. So what proportion of the time amongst these many repetitions would I obtain a difference between the observed means, well, the sort of simulated means in this imaginary experiment. Um, so we're going to do an experiment, get a difference between the observed means every time, um, and collect them up to form a distribution of imaginary differences between groups. Um, and specifically, look for the point where our uh, observed data falls within that distribution. So another way to put that is to say where the difference between the observed means is as great or greater than the one I actually observed in the real world. So you can imagine again, every time you do this, experiment in the imaginary world, you're going to get a difference between means. It's going to vary from one uh, imaginary experiment to another because there's imaginary variance in this imaginary world. And so you'll collect up a distribution of imaginary experiment results. And your question is, where does my real experiment results fall in this distribution of imaginary experiment results? Is my um, real experiment, my real result, sort of close to the middle of the distribution of imaginary results, or is it sort of extreme in this imaginary world? So having that question with all these sort of stipulations and constraints um, is still hard to answer without some further constraints. Um, oh, I should just say the proportion of the time is abbreviated as a p-value. So that's, this is the definition of a p-value. It's a metric about the rate of something in an imaginary world. So, as I said, we, we actually have to do add a few further constraints to actually be able to turn that those words into math. Um, so, 1908, William Gossett, working for the Guinness Brewing Company, came up with um, some constraints that allowed you to do this, published under the pseudonym student, um, so that other brewing companies couldn't realize that Goth that Guinness was using actual math to improve its uh, quality testing procedures. Um, so if he decided, he, he found that if you assume that the population has a Gaussian shape, Gaussian being sort of this bell-shaped curve, it has an explicit um, formula for relating where the curve should be on the y-axis given the position on the x-axis, but we won't even look at that. Um, so if you assume the population has a Gaussian shape and you estimate the sort of spread of that distribution from the data that you observe, then you can use an arithmetic formula to derive what the p-value is. So. Um, so he was able to prove that this is the case by actually creating many populations with a known mean and a known standard deviation, and then doing thousands of samples from those, thousands of mini experiments from that known population, and showing that his arithmetic formula is the same as doing that, gets out the same number as doing that whole process. Um, so he, 
people have been able to simplify this, and that's uh, Fisher follows up with the F test, which is the same as the T test, but F test then generalizes to ANOVA and things like that. Um, but since the p-value is an answer, so we, we can get a p-value out with traditional methods under some strong assumptions, but since the p-value is an answer to a question we didn't actually intend to ask, what do you do with it? So we can get that p-value, but that p pertains to an some property of an imaginary world. What do we do? How do we connect that thing about an imaginary world to inference we want to do in the real world? So there's two general answers to this. Fisher um, said you should treat the VP value as a measure of strength of evidence. So the idea is that you have a, the p-value pertains to a world in which the null hypothesis is true. Maybe if you had a really extreme p-value, that would suggest some degree of evidence against the null hypothesis. So he would say that um, if your observed difference is greater than 99% of the sort of imagined difference, that would be evidence that um, you're in the real world, the null doesn't actually hold. Certainly if you were in that imaginary world and you observed a result that's greater than 99 0.9% of the um, sort of what you what you should get under the null. You might say this is an odd data point, so this is sort of evidence that something odd is going on here. Um, whether you can then say, okay, now in the real world, that is the same. It's actually not only debatable; it's, it doesn't actually work. Um, so this actually isn't a satisfactory method of doing things because. Um, the p-value, again, pertains to the imaginary worlds under the null. So this, uh, the way this formula, or the syntax works, so p is the same as saying in sort of logical terms, the probability of the data given, that's what that bar means in logic land, probability of the data given the null, that's what I mean by having an imaginary world in, under which the null is true. We can talk about the probability of the data or probability of data as extreme as what we observed. Um, but that's not the same as talking about the probability of the null holding in our real world given this new data that we've observed. So you can't really, it doesn't like logically make sense to use the thing in the middle as giving you any sort of bearing on the question of the thing on the side. Um, additionally, because so, we're usually interested in evidence for or against sort of an alter some hypothesis. Um, and furthermore, the, if you actually get a true measure of evidence, um, it doesn't scale linearly with P. P ended up being sort of, um, well, it's monotonic with the, uh, true measures of evidence, but not linearly, so it's not super useful. Um, so, and people typically haven't really used Fisher that much. Um, more common is to use what Naaman Pearson suggested, which is to use it to apply a decision rule. So what does that mean? So what Naaman Pearson proposed was a decision framework. They say, you're going to do many experiments across your lifetime. Um, and we'll assume that in each of your experiments you need to choose you need to make a choice so you need to choose between the null or the alternative null being precisely zero difference between groups alternative there is some difference between the groups so if you're in that scenario where you need to make that dichotomous choice there's two types of errors that you could make there's the false positives so choosing the alternative when the null is true and the false negatives, choosing the null when the alternative is true. So false positives, that's the type 1 error rate you might be familiar with. That's saying that there's a significant effect when there isn't, saying there's a true difference when there isn't a true difference. False negatives say failing to see that there's a true difference when there actually is a true difference. So critically, you want to ignore the wording I've seen in more recent textbooks talking about 
they really try to assert that you can either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. That latter phrase seemingly implying that you're not going to make a decision in that framework, you're left in an uncertain case. Um, that's never what Lima Pearson intended by their framework, and it's when you get down to it, it's actually just incoherent. It's not. So ignore this idea that you can actually remain in an uncertain state in the name and Pearson decision framework. You're either choosing to accept it or you're choosing to uh, choosing to ex choosing the null or choosing not null. So yeah, no, it's that's like yeah. I don't know. I almost wonder if that's like a attempt to integrate like a postmodern everything's uncertain without realizing that that's what Naaman Pearson was doing in the first place like Naaman Pearson was all about that in the first place like um, so the Naaman Pearson decision framework allows you in that case where you have to make that decision between two things control the rate and that's just across your career it doesn't guarantee in any given publication what's going to happen but across your career, control the rate at which you commit uh, decision errors of the false positive type. Doesn't care about the other kind. Um, by applying a strict procedure to each experiment. And the procedure is as follows. You compute that p-value. Fisher would have said, you compute the p-value and that's it. You just present it. Um, and you make sort of a uh, human comparison of p-values, maybe from one experiment to another in terms of strength of evidence, but you... Um, just compute the p-value. Naaman Pearson additionally says um, you will choose the null if the p-value is greater than alpha. So you'll say you've pre-chosen alpha at some level. I actually maybe should have said that before computing the p-value. You choose alpha, and then you compute the p-value, and then you decide that the null is true if p-value is greater than alpha and you decide that the alternative is true, or that the null is false, if the p-value is less than or equal to alpha. Quick question. Yeah. So when you're writing up your results or your conclusions and you're saying, like, we were taught to say, like, there was no evidence for our hypothesis. But instead of saying that, this... If you were going truly name and Pearson, you'd say... There is like, no difference, basically. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to proceed as if there's no difference on the basis of this data, we want to proceed as if there's no difference. Um, this, I mean, works best when you actually do need to make deci binary decisions. So for a given person in front of you, you have to decide whether to give them the drug or not on the basis of some results. So you're not going to say sort of, you're going to have to do a thing. Um, I was just going to ask, what about the marginal values? We'll get there. Okay. So. And of course, the value that you choose at the outset specifies the sort of acceptable rate of committing false positives, and traditionally we put it at 0.05. Notably, other um, fields have different standards for this, so physics has like 0.0001 as its standard. That's because they can collect tons of data um, and achieve that level of, uh, of significance. So. In the same way that there's problems with the Fisherian perspective of um, P as proportional to evidence, um, there's problems with the name and Pearson perspectives, um, partly associated with the perspective philosophically, but also due to um, just how we get to the um, computing the p-value in the first place. So these could be con some of these could be conceived as problems with the Fisher perspective as well. Um, so the Analytic solutions that people have come up with to creating that p-value are actually a little harsh. They don't. They tend to be violated in reality. So remember, um, we're one assumption is we're only ever interested in the mean. Uh, whether two groups, for example, are different in their location on the distribution, but it might be pertinent to our hypotheses whether one group is more variable than the other. And the original tools, at least, developed for um, doing this don't. Um, address anything other than the mean. The other assumption, error is Gaussian. Um, often that's the case, sometimes it's not. And demonstrably, so for my fields, human, uh, when I, I do a lot of human reaction time stuff, and 
uh, people can't go faster than zero, but they can go. They can get occasionally slowed down. So we tend to get uh, sort of a skew in the distribution. Um, people tend not to be much faster than 200 milliseconds, but the distribution sort of peaks pretty quickly after 200 milliseconds to so about four or 500, and then you get this long tail out to beyond a second, where some people just uh, have a brain fart and don't uh, don't remember to respond until too late. So. The assumption of Gaussian error is often violated in the real world. Um, this one's a little bit more nuanced and you'll maybe understand it better when we get into stratified data, but um, the traditional tools assume that data are unstratified or singly and simply stratified. Um, we'll get into that. It's, it's like having data from many students in a school, but also data from many schools. So students are sort of clustered within schools, and then schools are yet another sort of um, unit of measurement that you might want to include in your data. Um, so another one, observed variances are relatively equal. Um, in fact, I, I mean, the math only works out if they're precisely equal. You can demonstrate that the p-value sort of varies a little bit as you start to violate that and people say well as long as they're i don't know within what do they say two or three times one another it's okay um i uh technically the p-value isn't accurate if the variances aren't precisely equal um so um uh, and sorry that's if the true variances of the true distributions are precisely equal the observed variances can be um, as long as they're relatively equal, that's fine. Um, and this one is one that is getting a lot more popularity lately. It's always been true, but people haven't really realized it. Um, the P only maintains its meaning both in like the original, what is the probability if I were to do this in an imaginary error, blah, 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 but also in the name and Pearson meaning of controlling your error rate if you predetermined the end before collecting your data. If you collect data, look at it, and decide, oh, it's kind of close to 0.05, I'm going to collect a little bit more data, then you've changed what the p-value is. In fact, you've changed, you've broken the name in Pearson framework, and you've guaranteed to increase the false positive rate. In fact, it is the case that if you do that strategy of looking at the data, collecting a little bit more, looking at the data, um, and iterate, you're guaranteed to get a p-value of less than 0.05 eventually. Because even if the null were true, the distribution of p-values is uniform, and so you just have to collect enough to get that random chance of getting a p-value less than 0.05. So you have to decide on an n ahead of time, run your study, and present the results from the study with that n. Um, there's some other sort of more computational reasons for traditional solutions not really working out so well. So they, you, you might know they don't like unequal groups. You have to do adjustments for that. They don't like missing data. You can do some extra procedures to sort of try to infer what the missing data would have been. But And this is a scenario with like you had somebody didn't Somebody did the verbal IQ, but didn't do the, what is the other one, uh, non-verbal IQ. Um, but you still want to do a model where you have both data points. You'd have to just toss that person uh, from the analysis if um, you're using traditional things. Or do this extra procedure that tries to infer what that value would have been. Um, Multicollinearity. Does anybody know what that means? Any guesses? Okay, so if you're thinking about Venn diagrams, um, another way of phrasing that is that they're correlated. Your predictor variable. So if you have the idea of you've got an outcome variable and multiple predictor variables, um, your predictor variables aren't supposed to be correlated at all. Um, so if they are correlated, so if you're trying to predict like, I don't know, um, uh, IQ from height and weight. Height and weight are going to be massively correlated, so your results get rather undermined by this that multicollinearity. Um, more uh, more strongly undermined to the degree that there's that correlation. So 
So they end up controlling for each other? No, that's the thing. This idea of controlling for doesn't exist. <laughs> they... <laughs> so is that only the individual variability for each of them? Is from the model? Well, what they end up doing is you'll end up, if you use the traditional sort of multiple regression tools, you'll end up getting a beta value for each of them that is meaningless. It's not it's not accurate. Like you, If you then tried to use that formula to predict new data down the road, you, it'd be crap. So, so I find school is a process of learning things, and then years down the road learning no, that this what is, you learned was completely wrong. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is actually a really big problem mm -hmm. because so much research is done with multiple regression, and mm -hmm. people have been taught, so taught that you can actually use this to your advantage in the form of ANCOVA where analysis of covariance, oh, if you've got two predictors that are correlated, you can actually use one to, so usually ANCOVA is used when you've got an outcome variable and two predictor variables. Um, you know that this one has an effect on mm -hmm. the outcome. Um, and so if you actually do that regression first, that will subtract out a lot of the variability in the data that's associated that, with this one's effect. Um, and people think that that's okay when these things are still correlated, like that that was what Ankova was developed for. Um, but, well, yeah, no, that's not what actually happened. This is an aside, so I haven't prepared any slides on this. But um, Ankova was originally developed when you had two completely independent predictors here. This one is the one that you're actually interested in, but you know this, you've measured this one, and it varies across your group, and you know from prior research that this one has an effect. So you can reduce what would otherwise be sort of seen as error variance in your outcome by doing this regression first, getting the residuals from this regression, and then finally doing the prediction of this, or the regression of this one on the residuals from this one. But, and that's, that's completely appropriate. If these two are completely independent, then you can do that. That's going to improve your statistical power. That's a great idea. But if you do that procedure but these two are correlated, you start completely messing up like your inference about this, the relationship between these two things because you've started subtracting out the common relationship between these two, which can overlap with the relationship between this one. What if they're correlated but theoretically like one doesn't like isn't related to the other? You know what I mean? So if you mean like in the real, in, like if you're to go out and measure everybody, it's a, the population correlation is zero, but in your sample it's slightly different from zero? Well, or? just like how like certain random things can like be correlated with each other even though they're not related because correlation mm -hmm. doesn't take causation into account. You know the website with all the different <laughs> yeah. correlations? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. So if you have like... So that's an example of yeah, of having like a true zero, but um, you're you happen to come across sort of a random. Thing. And I guess okay. it is slightly, yeah. Um, yes, that if you still take that ANCOVA approach of whenever you do software that does ANCOVA, effectively what it's doing is it's doing two regressions, one and then the and the latter one on the residuals of the first. Um, that will change the. That we, uh, I haven't considered this, like, I haven't done the simulations on that case, but I can't imagine that it's any different from the regular case of, and it's changing the beta value. Like, I actually have regression, like, simulations of this, and it can, like, change the sign of the beta um, from what it should be if you were to actually do a proper model that is explicitly model doing a single regression, but also including inference on the correlation between these two things. So we'll actually get into that. That's the core of multivariate is handling this multicollinearity. Um, and this is actually, I don't know why I had this one. This is a little bit nuanced. When you're doing like analysis on contingency tables, so data where you're putting observations into bins and then asking about is the count in these different bins differ from one bin to another. Um, if you have a bin with less than five, the traditional tools can't deal with that at all. Um, so again, yet more problems with multi with uh, well p values in general and Neyman Pearson. Um, Neyman Pearson talks about sort of the rate at which you 
achieve uh, or controlling the rate which you um, encounter errors across your um, career, but if you start doing multiple comparisons within a given sort of project or whatever, you're going to start increasing the likelihood that you're going to start encountering one of those errors. Um, you guys are all probably pretty familiar with multiple comparisons. There's attempts out there to try to correct for that. Um, the strong attempts of the Bonferroni where you just divide, you choose an alpha based on the number of comparisons you're going to make. That's going to reduce your power pretty dramatically, um, but it's going to definitely control your uh, error rate. There's more nuanced ones like, okay, well, I know I'm more likely to make an error on, um, well, I'm, the bigger differences are more likely to come out or are more likely to be true than the smaller differences. So I'll adjust based on the number of, number of comparisons and in order of how um, big the difference is. So I will use a more stringent alpha for smaller differences than for bigger differences. That's effectively what the, um, is that the honestly significant difference approach? All right. There's things you can do to try to work around this, but it's fundamentally a problem. Um, and more critically, researchers don't really know what a p-value mean, what a p-value means, um, and nor the logic of the Neyman Pearson framework. Um, so there is a variety of um, answers to the what is a p-value at the outset. Um, I'm not sure any of you expressed precisely that paragraph that exp explains what a p-value is, um, and if you do surveys of researchers and ask them, like, what does a p-value mean? And even give them a bunch of options. Um, they're terrible at selecting the one that actually is what the p-value means. Um, and they're also terrible at the Neyman Pearson framework. Um, and the result of, like, both misconceiving what the p-value is and misconceiving, like, the idea of the Neyman Pearson framework um, as a thing we do in science results in the... Um, combination of both like dominant types of um, of uh, perspectives so you try to combine like the strength of evidence with uh, sort of a significance criterion which yields the ever um, prevalent marginally significant <laughs> phrase descriptor which just isn't a thing philosophically like it's not coherent <coughs> in any manner um, you can talk about the precise value or you can talk about whether it's above or below 0.05. You can't say, well, it's close to 0.05. Trending towards. Yes. Only approaching. approaching. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, yeah, that's not a thing. <laughs> so these criticisms of p-values in general um, have been increasingly sort of uh, echoed through the literature. <coughs> Um, to the degree that people are starting to look at alternatives, one of which is confidence intervals. So instead of having a p-value on the difference between two groups, you might have a confidence interval on the difference between two groups. Now, if you look at the math behind p-values and confidence intervals, it's the same numbers. Like, the same numbers go into it. So that somewhat implies that you're not getting anything different out of the, the two. You get a little bit out of more of the confidence interval in that you're kind of, instead of a point value that the P uh, on a rate, you're getting a range of values on a real scale, like the measurement, the scale that you're using on to talk about differences on. Um, so that's a little bit better. You're starting to talk about your results and uncertainty about the results. Unfortunately, that uncertainty is still about an imaginary world, not the real world. So in the same way that people, researchers are really bad at interpreting what a p-value is, they're also really bad at interpreting what a confidence interval is. Um, so like, who, who wants to venture, after I've set you up to be, <laughs> to feel like you're gonna fail, um, who wants to provide their guess at what a confidence interval is? Yeah, Tony, give it a shot. Because I was kind of close to the p-value thing, but I was thinking, no, let me see. 
the interval um, within which. Um, so there's all these different ways of saying it, but like 95% of the time that you repeat this experiment, uh, it's a chance that this interval captures the true me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's that's almost accurate. See, the only thing true. left out is that you have to put in an imaginary world at the beginning. Right. You have to say in an imaginary world where this where this was true about the world. Yes. Then if I repeated this many times, that the interval resulting from each of those 95 of the intervals that I pre that I create um, yeah. will contain that imaginary true mean. Um, but we can't ask, we can't say that now I'm, comp we can't say what our confidence is that our interval we've observed right here now has captured the true mean at all. So the size, I mean, you can kind of say the location of that interval kind of says where the mean of your different, your data was, where, or sorry, what the observed difference was, and the size kind of correlates to how uncertain you are. Um, but the precise meaning that about 95 and probability uh, pertains to like an imaginary world again. So it's um, still, still not what we actually want. So the biggest problem with traditional methods though, in addition to all these other ones, um, is that they're not asking the questions that we want to ask. It's asking that big convoluted paragraph and trying to deal with that it's, it's taking the perspective that, okay, we couldn't compute the things that we want to ask at the outset, so we change to a question that we might be able to compute. We put a whole lot of constrictions around it, and then we try to shoehorn the result of that into something, but we're still not good at it. So we don't want to control the rate at which we make one of two types of decision errors across our career, as Naaman Pearson proposes because we're typically not making one-off decisions every paper we do. Um, we want to sort of, science is supposed to be cumulative. It's not a series of one-off decisions. We want to sort of collect evidence about the state of the world um, and present that to the um, literature, but other people are doing similar things and sort of it's come to know that sort of meta-analysis seems to be the better way of like making decisions. Um, certainly uh, when you're in a medical science world. They don't really rely on individual studies to make decisions. They collect the results from many studies together. So science is cumulative, so we're not making individual decisions, at least in a given sort of on a given data set. Um, and we don't, we're not really interested in talking about the probability of the data given the null, as Fisher proposes. Fisher just says use p-value, um, but that's again talking about a different thing that we're interested in. Um, we're talk we want to talk about the credibility of various hypotheses given the data. So how credible, whoops, so, okay. Um, so the Bayesian approach actually does ask the questions that we want to answer. It's, it's asking, what do the data say with regards to what I should believe? Um, what does, another way of putting that is, what do the data say with regards to how much I should believe in any given hypothesis relative to any other hypothesis. So we can ask in the Bayesian method, how credible is a difference of zero? How credible is a difference of one centimeter, if we're talking about the difference in heights between men and women, for example? Um, how credible is a difference of two centimeters? So we'll get sort of a continuous measure of the credibility of different hypotheses, and we can form that as a distribution. So, and I mean, I'll anticipate some slides at the end, but uh, the Bayesian approach not only sort of addresses the central issue with the traditional approach, whereby the traditional approach isn't asking the question we want, the Bayesian approach is. The Bayesian approach also addresses a lot of the computational and sort of restrictions that the traditional approach has that I noted. Um, the Bayesian approach doesn't have those restrictions and is much more elegant computationally, much more robust. So the Bayesian approach answers the, or sorry, I went through these already. So key to the Bayesian approach though, um, that sort of you have to 
get used to is that in determining the credibility of a given hypothesis, we have to include all the information at our disposal. And that is not only the data at hand, but also any prior data we've experienced. So now is when I remind you of the example of the diagnostic test. Somebody comes to you with the data of a, of a plus, but you have to integrate that data and its sort of diagnostic quality along with your prior expectation of based on the base rate. So this is what any prior data means. Um, if you actually had data from maybe that original experiment that established what the base rate is, then you'd use it. Um, most of the time, we don't have the data for all this stuff, so um, we we just use sort of a, we use our beliefs as a, sort of a summary of the prior data. So you as humans have experienced heights throughout your life. Um, you don't have like a list of all the heights of other humans that you've ever experienced, but you have some general intuitions about what um, to would be an exceptionally large height or an exceptionally small height. Um, or exceptionally large difference between heights of men and women and exceptionally small difference in heights between men and women. Um, so you probably wouldn't believe, or you'd be very surprised by sort of a given experiment that found that men and women differ in heights by one meter. But you wouldn't be too surprised by something that's more like eight centimeters, five centimeters. Um, you'd be very surprised if the sign were different than what you maybe expected, men typically being higher, taller than women. Um, so you have some intuitions about heights. We, we might differ from one to another in the precise sort of degree to which our intuitions taper off. So uh, one of us may have a intuition where sort of peak, uh, my peak credibility is around 10 centimeters. Um, another person might say peak credibility is around 5 centimeters. And one of us may think 15 is an okay credible. Another person might say 15, that's too too high. Um, so we might differ subjectively from one to another in how we've summarized our, our prior experience and how we've summarized that prior experience. Um, but we'll deal with that. That is an issue that people get stuck with at the outset or when hearing about Bayesian, but there are standard procedures for um, establishing um, reasonably objective or um, objectively acceptable prior representations. So to illustrate the Bayesian approach, we, let's actually remember the quiz that we had or the little scenario, clinical scenario. So we had a false positive rate of 30%, false negative rate of 20%, and a base rate of 10%. We worked it out what the diagnostic, what the, what we had somebody come to us with a positive and we wanted to know how should we update our beliefs to um, represent the person's um, probability of having cancer given their um, positive uh, result. So uh, we worked it out with just having an imaginary scenario with 100 people and worked it out through counts. What we were effectively doing there was actually working through um, what's called Bayes' rule, or the um, uh, the proper way to combine these. So the first three things, positive rate, negative rate, base rate, can be combined to talk about the positive rate. We actually just figured out the positive rate by establishing what those things were and then counting up, okay, there were 27 in one group and eight in the other group that had positives. So there was a combined rate of 35, if you recall. So of those 100, then you could say the positive rate is 0.35. So if you had that information, you can start using Bayes' rule. We didn't need to actually do the counting. Um, so this is Bayes' rule. Thomas Bayes, um, he was actually a, um, a cleric, or not a cleric, minister. Uh, Reverend Thomas Bayes uh, figured out that if you were to have those kinds of point estimates of rates, those probabilities, you can actually work out the probability of a hypothesis given data as a function of these three other things that are on the side. So you work out, so the first thing, probability of hypothesis, that's our base rate. Um, probability of the data given the hypothesis, so that's the um, rate at which you, you observe the data under the hypothesis of consideration. And then finally, probability of the data, that's the rate 
of the data regardless of what the hypothesis is. This is easier to understand if we actually apply to our quiz and give words to those. So cancer is our hypothesis. This person has cancer. So we say on the left hand side of the equals probability of cancer given a positive test result. Somebody comes in with a positive test result. We want to know what is the probability of cancer. Well, first we need to know generally what is the probability of cancer. That's that P cancer there. That's the base rate. Um, we need to know to have an estimate um, of those people with cancer, what is the probability of getting the positive result. That's that P positive given cancer. And then also, regardless of whether they have cancer or not, what is the probability of people getting a positive result. That's a P positive. So again, you can get these three things from the original three things that I gave you, the false negative and false positive rates. Um, and finally, we have the base rate there. So working out all that gets us to the same number that we had before. We worked it out just with the raw counts and figured out that 23 out of the 100 people will have um, a positive cancer and have cancer or given a positive result of the of the people of the sorry 35 people that had a positive result eight of them had cancer so that worked out to 23 if you wanted to do it Bayes rules way you could do the probabilities and work it out this way I'm not expecting you to ever work it out that way we're just showing you that sort of where this comes from um, and why it's called a Bayesian approach uh, so the example that I gave you this Point one represents what would be called a point prior. It's a single number representing sort of the um, whatever some prior literature would have suggested is the base rate of cancer in a population. But presumably that prior literature didn't go out and actually measure everybody and establish with a gold standard what the base rate of cancer is. Presumably it just did it on a sample. And depending on sort of the quality of that data, I would maybe be fairly credible of 10% being the real base rate out there, but maybe I'd also kind of believe in 12% or 8%. Um, probably wouldn't believe 80%, probably wouldn't believe uh, 1%, but would like have a representation of belief in the base rate um, as having different values. So you tip, this is actually more typical in the Bayesian approach, so um, the priors usually get distribution uh, reflecting sort of your credibility of various values. Um, 241. So um, to take an example, and this example is going to work through a very sort of narrow case of the Bayesian approach, showing you the use of a, a distribution as a prior. But again, it's not what I'd expect you guys to do by hand at all. Um, it's kind of showing you some of the math, but we'll be using a tool that does the math for us. Um, I just wanted to show you sort of what is going on in the background in a very simple case. So if we have this scenario, we want to know what is the mean IQ of Nova Scotians? Um, you could establish a prior belief, and let's say that prior belief is actually itself a Gaussian distribution um, with some mean invariance. So, we're talking about the mean IQ. We establish a prior belief of what the mean IQ, using again something that has a mean and a variance. So I might believe that, um, well actually I'll show the graphic of that in a second. So, and then I observe one Nova Scotian's height, and the question is how do I update my beliefs given that one Nova Scotian's height? So, mean yeah. Okay. What so height. height? Yes, sorry, IQ. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and indeed, yeah, oh. no, that should be IQ. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Like yeah. So I observe one Nova Scotian's IQ, and I have this existing sort of belief distribution. How would I use that new data to update my beliefs to say what I should believe now? So what I do is I actually will go through each of the possible values for a mean IQ that exists in the population, and I'll compute that formula. So where pH is the height of the prior distribution um, of the mean IQ value, and this 
is the height of the um, probability distribution given that person's height. I said the man's, that I should say the Nova Scotians. Mm -hmm. I think I started out with like a scenario where I actually had it as men and women and I was observing a single man at first um, to partially excuse my gender representation there. Um, and then this other thing, PD, actually ends up what's called integrating out. You actually don't, for a given data set, you actually don't need that in the formula if you're doing a continuous distribution. So to make this concrete, let's say that I have a prior on where the mean of the Nova Scotian distribution IQ is, such that I'll say that I'll have a peak of credibility of a mean of 100, which matches what we typically expect for IQ values. And I'll say that my the variability of my belief is sort of structured in a Gaussian with a standard deviation of, say, 5. So this is what that would look like. Again, this is, I hate how I can't have my pointer up there. Um, so this is where I think the mean of Nova Scotians IQ is. It's not. It, so I have a peak of 100. I probably really wouldn't believe 120 as the mean Nova Scotian IQ. I probably also wouldn't believe 80. Um, 90, is all, 90 and 110 are also pretty untenable with this specification. I probably believe like 101, 102, 103. Um, notably, the variability here is not talking about like the IQ of one person from Nova Scotia t to another. Um, this is just talking about like what I would be, how surprised I'd be. If you like invert the y-axis of the graph, it's how surprised I'd be if we eventually discover through thorough testing what the true mean would be. So I'd be not very surprised um, by 100. I'd be probably pretty surprised by 110 and 90. Incredibly surprised by 80 and 120. Probably not super surprised by 98 or 102. So the prior data point that you're using, it's not like prior research on IQ of Nova Scotians. It's like based on what's known, what yeah. What's well, your best guess at what it yeah. would be? Yeah, and presumably that best guess is on the basis of you looking at prior research and having prior exposure. Um, our brains, there's actually some neat neuroscience that do talk about the Bayesian computation happening in the brain. Certainly at a lot of the perceptual phenomena, there's good solid Bayesian computation going on. Um, if we're talking about like integrating from memory, lots of things, it's probably not super Bayesian. Um, but... Um, we can come to sort of, we will talk about more, this is a very sort of subjective representation, this may be mine. Um, you may have a standard deviation that's a lot wider, you'd be a lot more, you'd find maybe 110 more credible than that value is. Um, we can talk about establishing more objective or uh, less objectionable priors um, in a little in a little bit, but let's just except that this is maybe what we've decided. Now, it can be based on real hard numbers from previous research. Like if you have all the uh, IQ data that's ever been published before, and you can actually just represent that as find what the mean and standard deviation of that distribution is and represent that um, if you want to. Uh, so you can take real data and establish that as a prior. That's done a lot in if you're doing Bayesian meta-analysis. You're actually using real data to inform some of your priors. But here we're just sort of using Mike's own subjective um, prior for mean IQ uh, in this circumstance. So peaked at 100, it's got variability that falls off. I'm using the Gaussian just as a distribution of convenience. Um, I could have just had it as like a triangle, um, but the Gaussian actually has some nice computational properties, and it's one we're all pretty familiar with. Um, so having that true specification of a prior, if I observed somebody with a mean with an IQ of 105, what's that going to do to my belief? Like, what should I believe now? It's a little bit higher one, than like one person. One person. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to so I'm putting a prior on the mean of the population, but I'm going to just assume that people vary from one to another with the standard IQ. Is it 10 for IQ or is it 15? Okay, well, fine. 
Uh, we're going to do an, an example using 10. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize now I should have used 15. So this is an example where I'm fixing one sort of parameter of how the data sort of exists in the real world um, to 10, but I'm being uncertain on where I think the mean should be. We'll get into examples where we actually do inference on the, the standard deviation as well. It was just easier to show it in a circumstance where we're just uncertain about one thing, the mean. So this graphic, we've got on the x-axis YQ, uh, IQ, and the y-axis is probability, and the blue curve represents um, a, this is a IQ where the peak is at, that curve is, the peak is at 110, and the, the spread of that curve has a distribution of 10 here. So this is an example of a candidate um, true mean IQ of uh, 110 and a true standard deviation of IQ of 10. So in order to establish what the, one of the numbers, let me actually, because I think this slide is messed up. So one of the numbers we need to do that Bayesian computation is the probability of the data given a mean of 110. Let's see, is the graphic going to come up again? Damn it. Sorry, the, the graphs are not in order here. Sorry, what do you mean of 110? Well, so this is the, what I would do to update if I observed a 105, mm -hmm. what I would do is I'd, um, I'd go through and I'd see what does 105, uh, how likely is 105 under each of every single possible true mean IQ. So if I had a true mean IQ of 110, where does 105 fall for that? What is the height of 105? What is the credibility of 105 if the true or what is the sort of probability of 105 if the true were 110? The true for that one person? Yeah, or so true for the population, the underlying population. I thought we were saying the true for the population. Well, that's my prior. Okay. But what I do is for each point on the x-axis, um, I uh, ignore my prior and I say, OK, what if that were the highest point on the x-axis with a standard deviation of 10? So this is an example of choosing on the x-axis 110, and I say, okay, what if that were the true one? Where does, what is the height of the curve over 105, the observed value, for the true value of 110? So you would then go through and move that curve. So yeah, I'd move line. that curve like okay. point by point. If you, you, you can imagine that this actually takes infinite time because there's infinite points along that axis. There's a way to do this computationally that doesn't require you to do that uh, infinitely, but I'm mean, giving you an example of one point where you're looking at 110 and you're establishing how high is the um, point over the actual data we observed, and that's about 0.35. You do the same for, I think this is like 98, a hypothesis for 98. Again, we find how high is the curve for um, when it's peaked over 98, and that is about 0.31. I'm sorry, I should have had those. So if this is that height of the curve over the data point uh, for each of those is answering the question, what is the probability of the data given a candidate mean of 110? That was 0.035. It was the probability of the data given a candidate mean of point of 98? That was 0.031. And you were, if you were to repeat that for every possible point, you then have a curve reflecting um, in the same way that you've got a curve reflecting what is the probability of, um, or what is your credibility at the outset for every single point, you would then have a curve reflecting what is your credibility of, um, or the probability of the data given each uh, potential point, and the Bayesian, so this is the curve, let me jump to the next one. I think, does it? No. Damn it. Please rule. 
So if I were to repeat that, that's going to generate a value for every point that I can combine with my prior for every point, and that will yield a new distribution representing my posterior credibility. So having observed, having had at the outset the red curve up top that's peaked at 100, observing a datum of one single person with a IQ of 105, what I believe afterwards is the green thing, which is slightly shifted from 100, and indeed shifted towards that data point 105. Um, you can't really tell from this example, but um, the distribution has also narrowed a little bit. I started out with the prior where the standard deviation was five, but whenever you add, whenever you observe new data, you become more confident in what's going on, unless the data is really extreme, in which case that forces your credibility to widen a bit. So that's done for just a single point. Again, you won't actually have to do that. Um, we're going to uh, always be dealing with many data points um, and kind of doing a black box, but um, just wanted to give you a sense as to what's going on behind the scenes and connect it to that formula where we had before point estimates for both the probability of the um, hypothesis and a point probability for probability of the data given the hypothesis. If we have a continuous sort of uncertainty on the hypothesis, we can uh, figure out a continuous curve for the probability of the hypothesis and also a continuous curve for the probability of the data given each potential hypothesis. So if we have more than one observation, we can actually repeat the process for each observation that we have. So for the first observation, the prior is our subjective prior, the red one. Um, but for each subsequent observation that we add in, the prior that we use is the posterior that we got from the previous one. So I'll go back. This green one, if I observed, say, a new data point of, say, uh, 98, I'd use the green one as my prior for the um, updating to get what's happening after observing the 98. So you can iterate through given each observation and what we've known already and how we've updated already, what is the new pro posterior. Um, but uh, you don't actually, and critically, order of how you enter things doesn't matter. And you actually don't even need to do them one at a time. You can do everything at once. And we're going to use software to do everything at once. So, so this sort of is um, the opposite of the start of the talk where I was talking about how uh, traditional methods are inferior. Obviously, for each of those points, I'm probably going to imply that the Bayesian um, approach is better. So it answers the question we want to ask which is, given the data and my prior beliefs, how credible are various possible hypotheses? Um, for the two groups example, we might have a model with a group difference parameter um, and evaluate the parameter's posterior distribution. So if that posterior distribution were pretty much centered on zero, we'd be zero would be considered a pretty credible value. But if the distribution is considerably shifted away from zero, zero is no longer a very credible value. Um, so what does this mean? Well, 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 it's... If you get a zero, it's unlikely to be true? Or? Zero, uh, so in the way that was uh, expressed, if you sort of conceive of... Uh, remember I said that you can conceive of um, the question as per saying to, are these two groups different versus is the difference equivalent to zero? So yeah, zero meaning the size of the difference between the two groups. Um, if you parameter, if you structure your model to have a difference between groups parameter, you can um, talk about its posterior distribution and how credible zero or fair values close to zero are in that distribution. So if they're not credible, then, then that means that there's a moderator it, or? Well, if zero, if I just had a scenario where you've got heights of men and women, and I told you that, uh, zero as a uh, true difference between the two groups isn't very credible, you probably conclude that there is a credible difference 
that other value, and I could actually even tell you what is the most credible value for the true difference, what the variability and credibility is. What, what is, where, where is the mass of credibility for the true difference between men and women? So yeah, that's, so and it, that'll apply even to uh, all the models. And sort of, the key here is that we can, other benefits from Bayes, in addition to actually addressing questions we have interest in, is that um, we can build our own assumptions. There's far fewer restrictions on um, how to do the, how like your theories have to be structured. So you can talk about scenarios with non-Gaussian error. It's easy to talk about binomial data, count data, survival data. You can deal with outliers very nicely. Um, you can have hierarchical or cross structures. So hierarchical is an example of, sort of stratification, students nested within schools. Um, cross structures would be if like students went to different teachers within the same school, teacher and student would be crossed because um, some students will go to different teachers in the same school and some teachers would have different students. Or, so you can have more complicated sort of structures of how the data come about. Um, mixture models are a neat one um, that we'll talk about. That's where you could say that the data either came from this distribution or this other distribution. Um, and there's a variety of other sort of things that other types of model assumptions you can use. Um, you can critically, you can characterize not only phenomena that influence the mean, but also other things. Like, like if you have a model with different variants between two groups, you can look at whether the two groups, or if you have a model where um, each group comes from a Gaussian distribution, um, you can talk about the difference between the means, but you can also ask, do they also vary in their variants? Do they also vary in the amount of skew the distribution has? So it goes along with having non-Gaussian error. Um, you could talk about like if you're modeling outliers, whether one group has more outliers than another very easily. Um, and critically, they're computationally robust. So this is actually one, I came to the Bayesian, um, well, this talk espouses a lot about like the philosophical um, uh, troubles with the traditional approach. Um, and that's what I'm, uh, I find most troubling, but uh, I came to using Bayesian methods mostly because I started getting into models that um, frequent met frequentist methods couldn't handle. There was too much complexity in the model, and even when I used like the most advanced frequentist tools for doing bootstrapping and all sorts of um, computationally intensive things, it still was um, very fragile. It was. Um, I was able to run simulations demonstrating that uh, I was getting a lot of variability in the answers I asked. Um, so the or variability in the answers I got depending on precisely how I asked the question. So Bayesian ends up being far more computation robust. Um, the analogy I can give you uh, is that imagine you're on a lake and you have to, you're asked the frequentist has to, in order to answer a question, the frequentist has to go on a boat and measure the bottom of the lake and find precisely the very lowest point in the lake. Um, so that's going to take a lot of measuring, and you're always going to be a little bit uncertain to, as to whether you actually found the precise bottom. Because if you, if you imagine like putting a grid of measurement points on the lake and measuring at each point, maybe the precise bottom was a little bit between where you put that grid. Um, you can come up with search strategies for stepping in different sizes, but it always relies on your search being precise enough, and it's hard to measure how good your search is. With the Bayesian, um, the, ant the question you're asking pertains to just a general shape of the bottom of the lake. You don't need to find the very bottom. You just need to get sort of a general feel for the shape. And a um, there's clear methods for exploring the lake in a nice way and establishing whether you've explored long enough to be confident in your representation of the, of the lake. Um, so it's more computationally robust. It's, you can have more complicated models 
that you're more comp confident in. Um, some examples that uh, are that unequal groups are okay, missing data is okay, low count contingency cells are okay, outliers can be modeled, multicollinearity can be modeled um, explicitly. Um, the inferences that you're going to draw from the posterior distributions are immune to intentions, so talking about choosing n ahead of time or not. Um, it's also immune to multiple comparisons. Um, there are methods specifically to deal with the multiple comparisons in a nice, elegant way um, in the Bayesian approach that is a lot less haphazard or um, after the fact than some of the multiple comparisons that are used in the frequentist methods. Um, and it's 2 o'clock, so um, I'm going to stop there because I'm going to show you next time the, um, the tools and some examples of using the, 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 the tools to do some Bayesian analysis. Um, and we'll go pretty slowly through that at first, doing some simple univariate models, but still getting in our head the idea that, okay, we're going to specify a prior, and then we'll have data, and how to look at the posterior after we've updated the prior. Um, but I don't want to rush that for the next 20 minutes. So, question there? Any questions just generally on the content? Or? So, with your example about the IQ, where originally I thought, all right, uh, the population has a mean of 100, and I get this one data point that says 105, or was it 110? It was 105 at first, none. Yeah. So, you, you do this thing where you take your one data point that you got, and you move a Gaussian over it, and that gives you like a new Gaussian curve mm -hmm. of beliefs, which would be centered at your one well, data point. Look, but and, and so then you have your original Gaussian curve here, and yeah. then you have, the, you have the Gaussian curve of beliefs centered at your new data point, and then the one you showed in green was like here. Yes, because it's the sure. Yeah, and that makes sense. Well, my, yeah. my question is how the the fun like how much the shift shifted mm -hmm. is that a function only of the credibility of your prior. Yeah. Of anything else? Yes. Yeah. That so how peaked your prior is will influence how much the data will affect things. Right. So if I had no idea if that mean was good, it would move quite a bit. And if I knew for sure that mean was solid, it would move in yeah. the testimony. Yeah. Okay. And that's that sort of um, connotes to um, or anticipates what we'll be doing to uh, get old, get around this fear that I certainly had at the outset with Bayesian, which was, but certainly it's super subjective establishing a prior, so it's going to differ from one person to another. Um, the solution to that, um, well, is twofold. One, it's recognizing that as readers of papers that use the statistical methods, we are using a prior, our own prior in the head in the first place. Um, and certainly as writers, we, we might decide whether we sort of, how much we believe in a result or not. We can emphasize it or not as writers, but also as readers, we're doing that um, in the first place when you read a paper, how much we believe in the result of this person given our prior experience in this domain. Um, so be, having the Bayesian tools allow us to actually be explicit about that rather than just being willy-nilly in our head. Um, but having priors that are relatively, quote, uninformed will allow us to, like, get around, like, maybe you think the peak is around 102 or maybe you think it's around 98 um, for specific groups. So we might have these subjective differences in where, like, the peak might be, but as long as our, like, we represent our priors as relatively broad, they'll be amenable to being updated strongly by the data. And you can establish standards for like what relatively broad is. So for example, if you establish the, um, well, I'll use the amount of variability. So if I were to collect IQs from lots of people, I uh, will observe a variability in those IQs. If I use that variability of IQ from person to person as like the thing that I standardize my beliefs to. So if I say, okay, well, I'll have my belief at around, say, 102, a peak at 102, say I think that I want to take into account the um, 
perspective as time goes along, people are do better at IQ tests. What's that called again? Um, Flynn effect. Flynn effect. Yeah. Flynn. Oh, Flynn effect. Yeah. So I think the test was standardized a few years ago, and I think that current populations will get around the mean of 102. But I might say, what well, I'm uncertain about that, so I'll just use the variability of scores from one person to another as the variability that I use to represent my beliefs. So that reflects the fact that I, if you imagine that prior as sort of a you know, standard deviation of the prior as reflecting sort of the magnitude of which you can change your beliefs, you can change the difference between, I guess, the average person and the mean of that group um, is if I scale that to be the same, or I use that as the same as the average sort of belief and how far it is from my peak belief. That's a way of sort of having more of a standard representation of a prior that is, I mean, it's data dependent, um, but um, yeah, it's a way of making things a little bit more, I guess, proceduralized rather than just subjective out of the air. But we'll, we'll use, I mean, so I have some pretty good prior representations in my field because I've seen a lot of reaction time data and I have good ideas about sort of what variability should be. So it's actually not as super, not as contentious as like you might expect at the outset. Um, and what's great is that these tools, particularly in our modern internet and computing environment, we can actually provide the tools for critical reviewers to use their own priors. Maybe they say, oh, I don't believe that very much, so I'll actually change the prior. So that means that we have a literature where it's somewhat dynamic and what it's going to say. You might have the author presenting what they think, and but permitting the readers to say, oh, what, what happens if I tweak that prior a bit? Generally, you want scenarios where the conclusions or the inferences are robust to a number of different priors, um, and that's what particularly in the case of um, like if you're asking about a difference between two groups or whatever, a nice skeptical prior is to be centered on zero. You don't want to start out with your, uh, even the, even if like it's a phenomena that you're just replicating, so you might have sort of a known non-zero value that you might expect as a nice, uh, might use as a sort of a true prior. You can establish a skeptical prior by shifting it right, right back to zero and asking, okay, can we still shift away from zero with the new data, um, in which case that's an example of like a skeptical prior. That zero be, being the mean difference between the yeah, two. Yeah, yeah, or size of the effect, yeah. Yeah, flat priors, are, we're not going to be using flat priors at all. Um, so that's a scenario, uh, the concept flat prior, if you imagine uh, a flat prior for IQ, well the IQ scale, yeah, well, goes down to zero, and I don't know what the max like IQ score is, but imagine just a flat prior is a uniform distribution across all those values, which effectively means that um, I would believe, I would be equally as surprised by a score of 20 as I would 250, which is completely unreasonable. One other <laughs> argument against traditional um, approaches to that is that in a lot of cases, it sh you can show that the confidence interval, for example, that you'd get out of the traditional method is precisely equal to what you'd get out of a Bayesian method if you used a flat prior. <clears throat> so insofar as you can show that flat priors are ridiculous, <laughs> you can then also assert that the results from traditional methods are equally as ridiculous. Um, so. Yeah, we'll typically not use flat priors for a lot of things, um, particularly scenarios where like you have unbounded scales, where you could say, um, I believe a mean reaction time difference between these two groups of 10 days is equally as credible as a mean reaction time difference between two groups of 10 milliseconds. That's those who I much more believe 10 milliseconds than 10 days. So there are domain, most of our domains, we have pretty good representations of having non-flat priors in right. each case. It actually, another corollary is that it actually means that your um, 
if you kind of treat this as kind of like still in a Neyman Pearson like statistical test asking about sort of if we can shift the distribution away from zero and get a credible interval that's where 95% of the mass of our posterior is away from zero, you're going to get narrower distributions under the Bayesian, narrower credible intervals than you do confidence intervals because you're not using a flat, you're using something narrow that can be pushed around. Um, so you get more power that way. I don't like to talk about that much because I don't, I don't do that interpretation of the distributions myself, but yeah. But so not having previous existing data on what you think should be the prior is not a problem as long as if you set it to base your priors on what the population is. Like I'm thinking of yeah. like a software that we want to use with a new population that hasn't been used with that population yeah. before. Yeah, um, you could use actually like the prior populations that you've used. Yeah. Uh, so if you're talking about like normal population, I tested this software on 20 year old students. Now I'm going and testing a geriatric population with this. Right. Um, it probably wouldn't be a great idea to use say, let's just say it's a mean reaction time. Students are going to be like in the three to 400 range. Elderly populations are going to be in like the seven, eight, 900 millisecond range. Um, it wouldn't make sense to use the student prior for, but as long as you make the, you could center the student prior on that three or 400, but as long as you just have a wide prior, it'll shift, your posterior will shift to accurately represent that um, post, that elderly group having its mean more in the 700 realm. And in fact, any prior can be overcome, even no matter how narrow it is, any prior can be overcome by a sufficient amount of data. The amount of data you need to overcome that inaccurate prior, if it is inaccurate, um, depends on how tight you make it. So the key is to make relatively wide priors. Don't be ridiculous and have like 10 days being a credible value for a reaction time. But um, yeah, I, I should say, I mentioned this idea of like scaling your prior by the, or using like the standard deviation of the um, group, uh, one score to another in an IQ group, um, has the, uh, like the variability of your prior. That's the same as talking about having a prior on the effect size, which you guys do have pretty good intuitions about priors. Um, I forgot to mention that, but yeah. So like you can establish like, I've got a prior of an effect size of zero, but a very, I'll, I'll believe like an effect size of one, which is actually not super common in psychology. Um, not really believe an effect size of three, but so you can have, that's the equivalent to scaling by the variability of the data that you actually observe. So we'll we'll get into more examples. Kind of just want to seed your mind on um, more of the conceptual issues here.